Well, give a shout of praise to the Lord. Let's just lift our voice in the spirit this morning. Lift your voice. Hallelujah. Stir up the Holy Spirit in you. A right shoulder being healed right now. Right shoulders being healed right now. If you have a shoulder problem, lift your shoulder up right now. Someone's being healed right now. You don't have to wait. Lift your, lift your voice. Thank you, Father. Thank you for having There's an eardrum opening right now. Eardrum opening right now. Eardrum opening right now. Hearing. There's a burst of hearing coming forth right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for the operation of the gifts of the Spirit even as we begin. Praise you, Father. Satan, we adjure you by the name of Jesus. You take your hands off of every man, every woman, every young person here at World Harvest today. But we don't belong to you. We belong to Jesus. We were paid for by his shed blood on Calvary. And Father, we thank you that today we will bring honor and glory to that name which is above every name named in heaven and earth. For it is in his name, Jesus' name, that I pray and believe. And I expect a miracle. Somebody give a shout of praise to the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Wow. <laughs> I sing because I'm happy. And I sing because I'm free for his eye is on the sparrow and I know thank God I know yes I know he watches Nancy, you beat me up on this. And then Kenneth followed and beat me up on it. And then both of you beat me up after the service. I got the message. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven? And home when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me, His eye on the sparrow and I know he watches me and that's why I sing because I'm happy come on and I sing Me. Come on, give a shout of praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Praise God. Wow. Well, what shall we do this morning? <laughs> oh, oh. 
I apologize in advance. <laughs> oh. Mitch, be careful now. <sighs> How many times do I come into services when I have no idea what I'm going to do? <laughs> it's not that I haven't studied. It's not that I haven't prepared. Right. Right. But you get there and then God just moves in and you don't know what is going to happen. <laughs> Praise God. Let's just wait a while, see what happens. <laughs> Oh. Uh, Chelsea brought some of my books and resources up here, which are available in the lobby. Uh, if you'd like me to, I'll autograph them. Uh, I'm not going to autograph Lindsay's book, though I refuse <laughs> autograph her book. Yes, I will. Uh, it's called A Cry for Miracles, oh. which came out of the story of, uh, well, actually, a story about Chloe. Oh. Chloe was just a little thing. And it was on a Christmas Eve, which was Lindsay's birthday. Lindsay was born on Christmas Eve, about 20 minutes before Christmas. In fact, when the doctors handed her to her mother, it was Christmas. And uh, Chloe was just a little thing. And we were downstairs assembling toys. And if you've ever seen me assemble toys, <laughs> you haven't seen much. Uh, I'm good at sitting and watching while Lindsay uh, uh, assembles toys. <laughs> But all of a sudden, we heard a gasp, and we went to the stairs, and Chloe was at the top of the stairs, and she was just almost blue, couldn't breathe. And I grabbed her and put her in the car with me and drove as fast as we could to the, to the emergency room. And uh, Lindsay uh, went upstairs and kicked the door and began to cry. And the Lord spoke to her and said, it's all right to cry as long as your cry is for a miracle. And by the time the doctors examined her, her breathing was back to 98%. And she hasn't had a breathing problem since. But that was the impetus a few years ago for Lindsay to write this book, and she has republished it and uh, told a number of other stories, including her own healing from cancer. So that's in this book. Uh, I will not autograph this book. This is her book. And then I have my book, When All Hell Breaks Loose. Some of you look like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, the lady wrote me and said, send me one of those what the hell do I do books, you know. <laughs> I knew what she meant. <laughs> Looks like some of you know what she meant, too. <laughs> anyway. Facing your fiery trials with faith, that's, a, that's available. By the way, who got your shoulder healed a little while ago? The, the pain in your shoulder is completely gone. Where are you? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Somebody give praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. And who, somebody's ear started to open. Who was that? Somebody's ear started to open up. One, two, three. Somebody give praise to the Lord. Healing. Healing. Yes. Thank God. And uh, your road uh, to, 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 uh, to, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Where you have pain right here. Who has the pain right here on your side? Stand up, stand up. You have pain right here. It's on your side, down your rib cage. There's one. Somebody else? Is it somebody else? Two of you. Somebody else in Jesus' name. Uh, uh, in the authority of Jesus' name, I send the word to you right now. Yes, yes. I curse that thing. Pain, come out now. Now, both of you just start moving and twisting, turning. You're going to find that pain's leaving you right now. You're going to be able to move. You're going to have freedom. You're going to be able to breathe all the way in without cutting you. And the pain is leaving you. There it goes. 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 Come on, somebody praise with us. Hallelujah. 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 I'm <laughs> going to have a good time this morning. Uh, your road to a better life. Um, I believe that that's out there and that's a blessing. Also, I brought some, some CDs. Uh, God's way to increase encouraging words of hope. Uh, hear it, pray it, speak it. God wants you to have a better life. Uh, the, the, the CD and all those are available. And I'll meet you out after the service and I'll autograph it with my left hand. Yeah. <laughs> 
because I am left-handed. <laughs> my dad said to me, before he died, he said to me, son, when I die, the same power that has come down my right arm and into my right hand is going to come into your left arm and left hand. And I said, why uh, my left and your right? He said, because I'm right-handed, you're left-handed. <laughs> I mean, you know, it take a rocket science just to figure it out. Anyway, that's available to you. Chloe, I'm especially glad you're with me. Yes, She's my traveling companion. She takes care of me. I appreciate you very, very much. And I love you. And I'm proud of you. Yes. Um, God. Lindsay, who's no doubt watching online. Hi, sweetheart. Uh, <clears throat> Lindsay has a sermon in which she talks about the difference between the word and the world. And she says that there is the difference in those two words is one letter, L. One has an L in it and the other doesn't. And so she asked the question, what in the L do you want? Of course, we know how the world operates, but we Christians oftentimes operate the way the world operates too. We are men and women of the word, but each one of us has a little world in us. We don't like it. We don't want it to be there, but once in a while, it surfaces. So come on. Now, let's talk about real life. Amen. When my father stepped down and I took over the entire ministry and inherited a $60 million debt, when one day I owed no man and the next day I owed $60 million. The world began to rise up in me. <laughs> How am I going to do this? How am I going to make it through? How am I going to pay off the debt? How am I going to hold my head up if I don't pay it off? How am I going to stand in front of creditors and bankers and how am I and that little pocket. Come on. Now, I'm, I'm a man of the word. I've always been a man of the word. But there are times when a little world comes out. I doubt sincerely that I'm alone. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look left or right. Lindsay has never had any problem believing for finances. But that was my problem. I've never had trouble believing for healing. But that was her problem. And so where I was weak, she was strong. And where she was weak, I was strong. Now, that's a marriage. That's a marriage. Hallelujah. Where you help one another, where, yes. where that little pocket comes out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, don't look at me like that because you've got a little pocket too. Yes. I'm not the only one here that has a little pocket. No. Right. It's, not that we're, it's not that we're not striving. It's not that we're not men and women of faith. Right. Now, you put that L back in the word, how does the world handle it? Well... Let's look at what just happened. Here we are in the middle of a partial government shutdown. We've come through Christmas. There was great anticipation. And then Christmas ends and you start sliding downhill. But you rise back up again when you see that ball in Times Square come down and, and you know that a new year's coming and you've made all these resolutions and and now here we are on the 6th of January, and you've already broken half of them. <laughs> I'm just talking to you about real life today. 
I'm talking about where you live. And you have this great mountaintop experience in your life. And the next thing you know, you're in a valley. Come on. Why is it that after we have a mountaintop experience, we find ourselves in a valley? Well, I'll tell you why. I don't know. <laughs> but if you look geographically at the world, you'll see that you cannot physically get from one mountain to another mountain without going through a valley. The way God created everything, he created mountaintops separated by valleys. And what did David say? Yea, though I walk through the valley, he didn't park in it, he didn't build a monument to it. Yea, though I walk through the valley, and there's another shoulder being healed over in this section. If you just stand up, you're going to find your shoulder being healed right now. You're right in here somewhere. Yea, though I walk through, yes, ma'am, I see you, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Fear is not your friend. Fear is the devil coming to try to steal, kill, and destroy the word that's in you. Now here we've just come out of three phenomenal services with Kenneth Copeland. Now I've known Kenneth since I was a teenager. I was laughing at him saying he's going to live to 120 and he talked about last night being 13, you know. Yeah. And I just turned 70. And so last night I told him that 70 is 21 Celsius. <laughs> Pastor Nancy, that makes you considerably younger than me. <laughs> so I'm 21 Celsius. But I was so blessed. Are, are you aware of what we just experienced with, with the Copeland? In the world system, if you went to hear these outstanding speakers, you'd probably pay $800 to $1,500 to hear someone in the world of that caliber to teach you the principles of the world. And some of you have been to those conferences and you've paid that money. And here, Pastor Nancy didn't even charge you. She gave you an opportunity to plant a seed. But if she charged probably be $800 to $1,500, somewhere in that range, to hear someone yes. Yes. of that caliber yeah, amen. to take Mark 11 and lay it on us oh, yeah. and not let go three times <laughs> and preach as long as Kenneth preached. <laughs> now, Kenneth is like my dad. He doesn't preach by the clock. He preaches by the calendar. <laughs> By the time Kenneth is through, my rear end is worn out. <laughs> and then he said, all those of you who want hands laid on you, come up here. And every one of you came. I looked at his eyes. His eyes were big as saucers. I looked at Pastor Nancy. Her eyes were going bong, 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 bong. <laughs> I could hear Kenneth saying, how to get myself into this mess. <laughs> I turned over to Chloe and I said, now this is going to be a lot of fun. Watching how this happens. <sighs> But I'll tell you what, he poured Mark 11 into us. You talk about a mountaintop experience. What we've had, it's unparalleled. Here's a guy who's been across the river. He's been over the mountains. 
He's been up. He's been down. He's been in between. And not anything Kenneth Copeland hadn't experienced. And I experienced a lot with him because I've, I've been by his side for years. He's been a mentor to me as my father was to him. And Jesus was heading into town and saw that tree in Mark 11 and looked over to see if there was fruit on it. That's where that passage that he taught about started. And he walked over and talked to the tree. Why? Because the tree was talking to him. You say, well, trees don't talk. Well, that tree talked. The Bible says Jesus answered. You don't answer something that's not talking to you. Now, the tree wasn't using words. But the tree was saying, you're not going to get any fruit from me. And Jesus answered the tree and said, you're not going to, you're not going to bear fruit again forever. And all the disciples were standing there. And they all saw it and they all heard it. And it looked like nothing happened. And that's the problem in Christianity. If we don't see an instantaneous microwave miracle, we think that God has failed us. If we don't go through the drive through and our coffee is not steaming hot and our burger is not hot, we want to sue them. And one company did get sued because the coffee wasn't hot enough. I said, give me a break. Come on. The disciples saw it. They heard it. It looked like nothing happened. But the next day, Peter looked up and said, Jesus, Master, the tree that you cursed yesterday has dried up from the roots. You go outside here and you cut a branch off a tree and you hold it in your hand. It's still green. It's dead because it's been separated from its source. Yeah. It just hadn't gotten the message yet. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, yeah. But you give that branch a few hours and it won't be green anymore. Right. Yeah. It'll be brown. That's right. Why? Because it's dead. Right. Well, overnight that tree got the message. Yes, sir. And he said, Jesus, the tree that you cursed yesterday has withered up from the roots. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Or as Brother Copeland said, have the God kind of faith. Amen. How many of you want the God kind of faith? Amen. Not the world kind of faith, Amen. which comes and goes and it's intermittent. Amen. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say, Unto this mountain, this need, this problem, right. whatever it is, this attack, yes. be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his or her heart, but shall believe that those things which they say shall come to pass. He, she will have whatsoever they say. What are you saying? Amen. Are you saying what you have or are you having what you say? What are you saying? It's wonderful to have this mountaintop experience that we've had for those three services with Kenneth, but what happens when you leave this place? What happens when Satan smacks you upside your head with a lead pipe? What happens when you come down from the mountain? Come on. Well, if you study the Bible, you'll find a lot of great things happened on mountains. Noah's ark landed on a mountaintop. And the human race was saved. Abraham took his son up a mountain to kill him at God's order. And when he saw that Abraham was willing to sacrifice the son of promise... He provided a ram whose horns were caught in the thicket. And they were exchanged and the ram became the sacrifice. Somebody's got pain in your center of your back right here. You're being healed. If you stand up, begin to bend, you're going to find your back. You're being healed right now. You're right over here. Lots of wonderful things happen. Moses received the Ten Commandments on a mountain. 
And when he came down, all hell was breaking loose among the people. Elijah fought a great battle with 450 prophets of Baal on a mountain and won, and faith was restored in Israel. A lot of great things happened on mountains. But God never called anybody to live on a mountaintop. Where do we live? We live in the valleys and we live in the plains. And if you study the Bible, you find that virtually every miracle Jesus did happened in the valley, happened in the plains, happened where people live, where people are. What do you do when the party's over? The world would say the party's over. It's time to call it a day. They've burst your pretty balloon and taken that moon away. They'd say it's time to wind up the masquerade. Just make your mind up. The piper must be paid. That's what the world would say. After they've had their so-called mountaintop experience, when they come down. Jesus had an experience like that. He took Peter, James, and John up to a mountain. Why only those three? The Bible doesn't say. I do know that he took Peter, James, and John into Jairus' home. And those were the only three that he took with him. Perhaps it was because Peter was the chief apostle. And Peter is the one who recognized who Jesus really was and said to him in answer to Jesus' question, you're the son of God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, Peter, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this. And because you know who I am, upon this rock of revelation, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. Amen. Amen. Peter, James, and John apparently were the top three, the most dependable. And so he took Peter, James, and John up the mountain and left the nine in the valley. And when they got to the top of the mountain, something supernatural began to happen. The Bible says that Jesus' body began to glow. And suddenly his clothing became as white as white can be. And Peter and the others were shocked. They'd never seen anything like that, but suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared. Now, you're talking about eyeballs coming out on stems. You're up on a mountain, and suddenly Moses and Elijah, the two central key figures in the entire Old Testament, show up. Yeah. Moses representing the word, the law, yeah. and yeah. Elijah, the most powerful prophet of all, yeah. Yeah. the greatest prophet he's known as. Yeah. Yes. Moses and Elijah show up, and they're having a conversation with Jesus, and Peter, James, and John get to witness the whole thing. And they're standing there and they're wondering what to do. They're half scared out of their minds. They're wanting to hide behind a rock. And Peter, not knowing what to say, says, well, I'll build you shelters. Let me build one for Jesus. Let me build one for Moses. Let me build one for Elijah. When all of a sudden a huge cloud engulfed them and a voice in the cloud said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. You talk about being afraid. Yes. Yeah. Nobody knew what to do. Yeah. <laughs> And right in the middle of it, wham, Moses and Elijah disappear. And they're alone with Jesus again. Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, I would have some questions. And Jesus said, let's don't talk about it. Have you ever asked Jesus a question and not gotten a reply? Have you ever tried to tell God what to do? Now, you can nod your head yes because you know you can go to hell for lying. <laughs> I've told God what to do. I've told him how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, and who to do it to. Yeah. And he has never done it my way once. I want to be in charge. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a take charge person. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the world in me. Yeah. When I faced all that debt, I wanted to be in charge and my wife had to, had to help me. She had to pray over me and she had to encourage me because that was an area that I, I had a shortfall. Mm -hmm. And then when she was struck with cancer 
I had to take her by the hand and do the same thing for her that she did for me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Amen. And today I've got no debt and she's got no cancer. But we want to be in charge. Yes, sir. Our training, the way we came up, we're taught in the world system that we're to be in charge. But I've got news. He is in charge. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what he's doing. Amen. Amen. And what Brother Kenneth was trying to share with us the past several days is how to get over on God's agenda. Yes. How to use our faith. Yes. How to believe God. Now here come Jesus, Peter, James, and John down the mountain. They've had this tremendous mountaintop experience. And they get down to the foot of the mountain and there's a big crowd, including the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who had come up from Jerusalem in order to entrap Jesus and hopefully arrest him and put him in prison and if possible, put him to death. You have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were sad, you see. Yeah. That's how they got their name. They were sad, you see. That's right. And they came to try to trap him. When out of the crowd, a man came forward and said, Jesus, I brought my son who is demon possessed to your nine disciples and they could not cast the demon out. And Jesus said, you perverse generation." How much longer must I be here with you? Now, many people believe he was talking to the man, but I don't. Many people think he was talking to the disciples, but I don't. I believe he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who come to trap him. And he said to the man, how long has he been this way? The man said, since he was a little boy. And that spirit comes and throws him into the fire and throws him into the water and makes him foam at the mouth and gnash his teeth and tries to kill him. And I tried to get your nine disciples to do something and they couldn't do anything. So if there's anything that you can do. Now I've said everything that I have said so far to bring me to this point. If there's anything that you can do, Jesus said, it's not if I can do anything, it's if you can believe. All things are possible, he said, to him who believes. Now listen to this. If you missed everything I've said so far, don't miss this. This is critical this morning. This is the follow-up to what Brother Copeland was preaching. He said, I do believe, but Help me with the little area that I don't believe. I do believe you, Jesus, but I've got this little pocket of doubt. I've got this little part of my life that I've not gotten control over. I do believe, but I've got this little pocket of doubt. Now the lining in my trousers go inside, but when you pull it outside, even though it's not big, it stands out. Everybody can see it. Everybody can see there's a little pocket. Of, I believe. Yes, I believe. I believe every word Brother Copeland said. And I'm doing everything in my power, but Lord, there's one little area in my life that I, I haven't I haven't overcome I haven't got control over it my faith hasn't mastered it yet I, I'm on my way but I haven't quite arrived and so when we human beings slip and fall and we make a mistake we, we beat ourselves up because we act as if we're supposed to be superhuman well, by faith we are superhuman, but we are human beings. I have some areas in my life 
that I'm still working on. How about you? I am still under construction. Some of my paint is still wet. Come on, sir. He said, Lord, I do believe, but help me with this little pocket of doubt. Now, the pocket of doubt that you experience may be in the realm of finances, like it was with me. It may tear you up on the inside. During that period of time when I was facing all that debt, I, I became another person. I became angry. I became bitter. No one wanted to see me come home. I was an angry man because I was being slammed every day by the financial situation. And I would come home and I, I wasn't myself. Lindsay didn't look forward to seeing me. My children didn't look forward to seeing me. I, I, was, I was oblivious. One day, Lindsay was at home, and I was working, and, and uh, she, she went over to cook something on our gas stove, and uh, the pilot was out. And uh, she turned the gas on, and it didn't come on. And, uh, and instead of turning the gas off to light the pilot, she accidentally left the gas on and lit it, and it blew up in her face. Thank God she had her glasses on, but it blew off her eyebrows and blew off a huge chunk and the top of her hair. Now, I wasn't home yet. And the girls said, when they realized she was okay, they said, let's see if Daddy notices it. <laughs> and Lindsay had a way of when I would come home, she would say, now, don't bring that in the house. You stay outside and you shake that off. Don't you bring that into our home. And sometimes I'd have to stay out there in the driveway for 20 or 30 minutes praying in tongues to try to get that off of me that was on. Because I felt like I'd gone through a, a you know, a, some kind of something <laughs> that day. A meat shredder, I started to say. And I came in that evening and I was tired, I was angry, I was bitter. And I came right in and just sat down and started to eat. And the girls were laughing, and I didn't know why. And I sat there eating, and Lindsay walked over to me and said, do you notice anything different about me? <laughs> and I said to her, did you get new glasses? <laughs> I was so far into my little pocket of doubt yes, that I was unaware and my wife shouted, I blew my eyebrows off. I blew my hair off. <laughs> and she started to give me what for when the Lord stopped her and said, now, if he didn't notice that, imagine what he must have gone through. Wow. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I remember once when the children were little, we were at a, an Italian restaurant there in town and we were sitting, the five of us, and a man walked over to our table, which is not unusual. People do that. They want to come over. They want prayer. They want an autograph. They want to say hello. They see me from television. They see Lindsay, and they want to come over. And this man walked over, looked me in the eye, and said, you don't have any idea how much I hate you. <laughs> I mean, I'm eating spaghetti, and I... <laughs> When's the last time somebody said that to you in a restaurant? <laughs> and the waitress, and then he turned and walked out. And the waitress came over and she said, what did he say? And Lindsay told him and she said, well, I would have just hit him. <laughs> and I said, well, imagine what he must be going through. Yes. Imagine what his family yeah. must be going through. If he could say that. I'd never met him as far as I knew. He'd never met me. But when you're under such stress and pressure, little pocket it comes out now yours may be finances it, it may be in your body you may have battled with an attack against your body and you went through the prayer line last night and nothing seems to have changed 
and you wonder why and you feel like, well, God's let me down and I'm coming down off the mountain now and I, I don't know what to do. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's your marriage that's falling apart and you're keeping up all the good appearances that you know how. Or maybe it's with a son or with a daughter. Or maybe it's uh, the loss of a job or there's trouble in your business. You know, too much month at the end of the money. Or maybe it's something else. And it's gnawing at you. And you believe. You're believing with all of your heart. But you have this yeah. little yeah. pocket here. Yeah. This little pocket. Yeah. The man said, Lord, I do believe. But help me in this one little area yes. Yes. where my believing's falling short. Yes. Now, that's the story of all of us. Every one of us could stand up and testify one little area if we were brutally honest. Every one of us would say there's one little area that we haven't gotten control over. I have it. I imagine you have it too. That's right. Jesus reached down and took hold of that boy commanded the demonic spirit to come out and when it came out it threw the boy on the ground and he rolled around and writhed in all that was going on foaming at the mouth and then looked like he was dead the people there actually thought he was dead and Jesus reached out and lifted him up and healed him God knows each one of us. He knows how he made us. He knows the areas where we need help. And that's why we come here. So we can get built up. So we can have this mountaintop experience. Because the valley's coming. Now, I'm not saying something negative, so don't think I am. But you can't go from one mountain to another without going through a valley. You can't do it. It's not physically possible. And most of the miracles Jesus did happened in the valleys. Yes, David killed a lion and he killed a bear, but Goliath was coming. This is what people need to hear. People, I'm talking about people in your family who don't know the Lord. I'm talking about people in your churches who don't know the Lord. Come and hear you pastors every Sunday. Give you a good hearing, shake your hand. But wouldn't know Jesus if they met him coming down the road. That's why I learned from my father to preach experientially. And to become vulnerable. And to let my hair down, what hair I've got, <laughs> so people can see yes, sir. how we have overcome. Yes, That's yeah. right. Yeah. Amen. Yes. I remember in 1977, in February, when my sister, my older sister, whom Chloe favors, my older sister and her husband were killed in a plane crash, an ice storm over Kansas. And we got the news that my older sister and her husband had been killed and left three beautiful young children and uh, nearly killed my parents. This was their firstborn. She was 10 years older, nine years older than me, Rebecca, and her husband, Marshall. And we cried and we cried and we cried and we cried until there were no more tears. And there are those who said to my, my dad and my mother, you need, to, you need to get in a plane and go somewhere and, and get away from everything. My, sad, my dad said, no, 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 no. I'm not the only person in America or Canada who's lost a child. I'm getting up on television on Sunday, and I'm going to tell the story. 
that's going to help me get through it. But more than that, it's going to help a lot of others. That's right. That's right. That's right. One of the largest TV audiences we've ever had in the history of our ministry was that Sunday. Because it was in every newspaper in America. Everyone knew. And everyone was tuning in to see what Earl Roberts was going to say about his daughter and son-in-law being killed. Millions of people watched as he poured his heart and preached from the Word of God of how to get through that storm. Now, my fellow ministers, and a great deal this morning are ministers of the gospel. That's how you need to preach. You need to take the Word and you need to apply it to yourself and demonstrate. And that's what Brother Copeland did. He showed us where he slipped and fell. He showed us his successes. He became vulnerable. That's what makes us real. That's what makes people want to tap you on the shoulder and say, pray for me. Your prayers can help me. Because if you can make it, I can make it. That's right. Amen. Now this morning, we're going to deal with that little pocket of doubt. Amen. Now I don't know what yours is. Not really any of my business. But I guarantee you, you know what it is. You know what it is. That's what we're going to deal with this morning. We're going to deal with it in prayer. We're going to take authority over it in Jesus' name. We're going to command it to come out. Just like Jesus commanded that spirit to come out of that boy. And the spirit came out. In the same way, we're going to take authority over it. And we're going to eliminate that from our lives. And I'm going to be at the head of the line. Because there are some things in my life that need to be gone. Just like there's some things in your life That's right. yeah. That's right. that need to be gone. That's right. So stand up with me this morning. I prayed and asked the Lord how I should follow Brother Copeland. And this is what he gave me. Father, you created us as flesh and blood. And when someone says to us, we're in the flesh, they're really telling the truth because we are in the flesh. The real us is down inside our flesh. Yes. So when they say you're in the flesh, they're really telling the truth. We are in the flesh. The real spirit is down inside our flesh. That's right. Our flesh is not really us. Right. Our spirit is inside our flesh. Right. God made us flesh and spirit. So, Father, right now, and I want you to lay your hand on yourself and wrap your arms around yourself. And I want you to just say to the Lord, Lord, this is the little area that I, I want to deal with this morning. Whatever it is, you know what it is. Father, in the authority of the name of Jesus, I come against this little pocket of doubt. For Lord, when that man said, I do believe, help me in the area where I'm having trouble believing. Lord, that's me. And that's many that are here today. Lord, I take authority over this area. Now, it may be spiritual, it may be physical, it may be financial, it may be in your emotions, your family, your business, your job, your ministry, and some other area of your life. But in the name of Jesus, and by his authority, I take hold of that little pocket and pull it out of you. Are you listening to me? I pull it out of you. I pull it out of you. I'm taking hold of it with my faith and pulling it out of you. I'm handing it to this angel that's standing right behind me because he knows where to take that little pocket of doubt so that today 
when you leave this place and this week when you leave this conference and you come down from this mountaintop experience that we're all having and the demonic forces come just like they came against Jesus you'll know that you have the authority to deal with them not only in your own life but in the lives of others and that's what our Christian walk is all about it's not just about us it's about being a witness and I pray this prayer over each one of you today in the name of Jesus I take authority over this thing and pull it out of you and I declare by my faith today that you will not leave this place the same in Jesus name Someone needs healing in your back. Where are you? Wave your hand at me, you who need healing in your back. Just wave your hand at me where you're standing. Somebody touch them right now where they are. Touch them. Somebody touch them. If you see somebody with their hands raised, touch them. Father, in the authority of Jesus' name, I send the word into your back. Every back be made whole. Every pain, problem with the disc, with the vertebra, with the spinal column, with the shoulder blade, with the collarbone, with the, yes, I, even the spina bifida, yes, I hear that, Lord. With the curvature in the spine, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over that. Now, there's a healing wave. It's coming right now. It's coming right through that wall. It's coming right across this congregation. And there's warmth coming into backs right now. And you're going to be able to have freedom of movement. People are going to have freedom of movement in your back. And you may be able to do something right now that you've not been able to do. You may be able to move in a way right now in Jesus' name. Who this morning needs healing in your shoulders? Wave your hand at me. Wave it, wave it, let me see you all over. Now someone touch that person. Someone touch them in the authority of the name of Jesus. I send the word into your shoulder. Remember the Bible says in Psalm 107 verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. I send the word to your shoulder. Shoulder, in Jesus' name, be healed. Every pain come out so that you have the ability to do what I'm doing with my shoulder right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Shoulders are being healed right now. Someone's going to be able to have complete freedom of movement. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Who needs healing in your knees, your hips, your feet, or your legs, or the veins in your legs? Wave your, wave your hand at me. Somebody touch them right now. Father, in the name of Jesus. Now, there are varicose veins that are going down in the back of the right leg right now. You'll be able to reach down and feel those veins have gone flat. In Jesus' name, I speak to the knees, the swelling, the fluid that's built up. I speak for all that fluid just to drain out and be assimilated throughout your body with no harm problem with the kneecap, with the ACL, the MCL, in Jesus' name, I take authority over that. Come out. All that, there it goes, there it goes. Pain, come out. Again, I say, pain, come out now. 
and enter into these knees again no more forever. Someone's going to be able to lift your knees now. You'll find the pain is gone, the swelling is gone, the clicking is gone, ankles, feet. Kenneth ministered on toes. Thank God for all those testimonies about toes. Hallelujah. Feet, knees, legs, hips. In the authority of Jesus' name, hips. Someone here this morning, every time you sit down, it, 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 just, it just shoots pain down the back of your legs. I rebuke that sciatica problem right now in Jesus' name. The hip, the problem where you fell in Jesus' name, I rebuke that. And pray for healing to come into your hips now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, their shoulders being healed now. And someone's going to be able to move your hips all the way from right to left. You're going to find the pain is gone. You're going to be able to lift your legs and find you're able to lift them. You're going to be able to walk around, feel like you got new feet. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. There's someone here who has a blood sugar or a blood pressure issue. Where are you? Blood sugar or blood pressure? Lift your hand. Lift it up high. Now, someone who's near that person, touch them. There's healing. Ah, yes, yes, yes. They're healing in fingers right now. Healing in fingers. Someone who has a, a, a thumb that's twisted from arthritis is being healed right now, and you're going to be able to have complete freedom of movement of your thumb. It's straightening out. Did he not say, I will make the crooked places straight? Hallelujah. Blood pressure, that which is too high in the name of Jesus, come down. That which is too low in the name of Jesus, come up. Regulate. Blood sugar, diabetes, which is too high, come down. Hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, come up and regulate. 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 Everybody say regulate. regulate. That's what you want. Yeah. You want it to regulate. That which is too high to come down, that which is too low to come up. Yeah. Regulate. regulate. Everybody say regulate. regulate. In the name of Jesus. Blood pressure, blood sugar, regulate. I send that word to you now. And he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. I send that to you. Every vessel, every blood vessel, every artery, every vein, every capillary, open up that the blood may flow unrestricted. Carotid artery, open up. Arteries around the heart, open up. Arteries, the main arteries that go down in your legs, open up that the blood may flow unrestricted. Yes, I'll do that, Lord. I come against infection. Wherever it is in your body, I curse it in Jesus' name. Every infection, come out. I take hold of that infection with my faith and pull it out in the authority of the name of the Lord. There's a person who has a growth on the inside of one of your legs. And if you'll reach down and feel, you'll find the growth is going flat. In Jesus' name. I'll never forget being in Kenya, praying for a woman who had a basketball-sized tumor in her belly. And when I prayed for her, her stomach went flat. And the tumor was completely gone. If he can handle a basketball-sized tumor, he can handle that little tumor. In Jesus' mighty name, I send the word to you. Migraine. I rebuke the migraine. The continual pain just seems to be there. It seems like every other day, it seems like it's just on you. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over the migraines. I bind it. That pain behind your eye, come out. Come out now in Jesus' name. I take hold of it with my faith and pull it out of you. That's how the Lord showed me years ago that he would use me. 
He said, Richard, you'll have twice as many healings as your father had because you will not have to lay hands on people the way I, or the way I anointed him. In order for my father to activate the healing ministry that God gave him, he had to use his right hand because that's the method that God gave him. But how many of you know that God has many different methods? God is not limited in his methods. And he said, because I'm going to be on television so much more, I will not be able to touch people. And I will have crowds, especially in third world nations, where there's no way. When we had 200,000 uh, in Kenya, there's no way you could touch that many people. Can you imagine if I had done what Brother Copeland did and said, all of you come up here. I guarantee you all 200,000 of those Kenyans would have come forward. I couldn't do that. But there's another method. One's not better than the other. It's just different. That's right. Amen. That's good. Uh -huh. The method that God gave Brother Kenneth is different than the method he gave me. His is no better than mine. Mine's no better than his. It's just different. So we're not making a comparison. It's just different. And when you come under a man or a woman's anointing, they are required to operate in that anointing and not operate in somebody else's anointing. Amen. Amen. I used to, you know, I, I, that used to bother me when I was young. I, 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 people used to say, how are you going to fill your dad's shoes? You know, you ought to try being Earl Robert's son sometime. You know, how are you going to do that? Well, I realized early on that he wore an 11 and I wore a nine and a half. I wasn't likely to be able to fill out a size 11 shoe. I tried when I was a boy. I put Kleenexes in the end, you know, I put on his shoes and you usually fall off. But God said, you don't, you don't have to fill out 11. You just fill out your own shoes. You be the man that I've called you to be. Don't try to be like other men. Be like Jesus and bring healing to the people. Praise God. In the last 20 years, my wife and I have seen and received over 150,000 healing testimonies. Not a day goes by without our office ministry headquarters receiving testimonies from all over the world. But it's not because of me, it's because of him. In the authority of the name of Jesus, I come against this problem with your eyes. Anyone with an eye situation, raise your hand. Cataract, glaucoma, something like that. Touch that person that's holding up their hand. And anyone with a problem with your hearing, we had three hearing healings earlier. Who else has a need of healing in your hearing? Wave your, hand, wave, wave your hand at me. Now, someone touch that person. In Jesus' name. You feeling what I'm feeling? <laughs> That's the presence of God. Be healed in your eyes. Be healed in your hearing. Eardrum, your station tube, open up. And here it comes right now. Snapping, the popping. It's like Rice Krispies going off in somebody's ear. Snap, crackle, and pop. Eyes open up. Cataract dissolve. The blurred, the blurred vision come out. Vision clear up. Be healed in your hearing. Be healed in your vision. Be healed in your breathing. Who has a, a need of healing in your breathing? Wave your hand at me. Somebody touch that person who's right waving their hand. In the name of Jesus, the COPD, the asthma, the emphysema, the bronchial problem, in the name of the, the sinus problem, in the name of Jesus, lungs open up. I just begin to breathe in. It's healing coming in lungs right now. Kidney, liver, digestion, ulcer, hernia, gallbladder, coelitis, pancreas, in the name of Jesus. Take hold of that by faith. Pull it out of you. All that which has tried to attach itself to the organs in your body, come out in the name of Jesus. Cancer, you foul, tormenting thing. 
I adjure you by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Every cancer come out. Come out of the bone. Come out of the breast. Come out of the liver. Come out of the brain. Come out of the skin. Come out of the blood. Come out, cancer. We arrest you. In Jesus' name. Hardly a week goes by without hearing of a tremendous cancer healing. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. I read a medical journal article the other day. And it confirmed what Brother Kenneth said the other night. That cancer doctors are getting their patients together and leading them in laughing. It confirmed what I almost stood up and said, Kenneth, I read an article saying the same thing that that surgeon he talked about the other night from Detroit. And who knows what God may do tonight. Because you know, the Bible says, laughter doeth good like a medicine. And we might have to have a double dose tonight. So I apologize in advance. For what is likely to happen here tonight. It's liable to look like a combat zone. <laughs> That'll be all right with me. Praise God. Every sickness. Every disease. For Jesus came to heal, the Bible says, all manner of sickness and disease. All sickness, all disease, in the authority of Jesus' name, I speak to you, command you to come out. You take your dirty, rotten, stinking, filthy hands off. And Father, we release our faith. Come on, let your faith go this morning. I let my faith go. Say it with me. I let my faith go. Say, Father, I release my faith. I let my faith go for a miracle in my life. For nothing less will do. In Jesus' name. Now just begin to lift your hands and give him praise. Give him honor. And give him glory. Did I not say unto you that if you would pray and stretch forth your hands and use the authority that I have given you, that I would bring miracles in your midst? Praise you, Father. Thank you for that word. Yes, you did say that to me. And I thank you that it's being confirmed in this service. In Jesus' name. Thank you for this church. Thank you for what it has meant to me and to my family. Thank you for these precious ministers of the gospel whom I have now gotten acquainted with over these times of being here in the past year. Praise God for your ministries. Praise God for your churches. Praise God for the anointing that's on your lives. I've fallen in love with you. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here. And Pastor Nancy, thank you for this invitation to come. It was an invitation I wasn't expecting in the natural. But I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to come. And I praise God for it. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. Let's just lift our hands one more time. And I sing because I'm happy and I sing because I'm free for his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. Give the Lord a good shout of praise. Pastor Nancy. Praise Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can't wait till tonight. Holy, I hear the Lord saying a Holy Ghost blowout. <laughs> Holy Ghost. What does that look like? We'll come and find out. Holy Ghost blowout.
total combat zone. Hallelujah. I sing because I'm happy. Come on. I sing because I'm free. That's high, isn't it? For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to see a show of hands of those of you who say, from the time this service began to the, just now, you can say, I, I can already tell a change in my body. Raise your hand. Raise it real high. Raise it real high. Turn around and look, everyone, turn around. Raise your hand real high, not just at shoulder height. Look at, look at this. Look at this. Keep it up. Keep it up. Look. Look what the Lord has done. Amen. Hallelujah. The yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for that anointing, that yoke-destroying anointing. Oh, we're so grateful to be the healed. So grateful to be whole. We so appreciate it. Thank you. Hallelujah. It's important that we tell him we acknowledge what he moves in our lives how he moves, when he moves. It's important to acknowledge that and show gratitude. That's how you keep it. Be grateful. Amen.